I am honored, honored to speak with a man that I've been wanting to talk to for a long time, Richard Dolan, who is, what would you call yourself, a ufologist? What is your exact, and, and, and by the way, let me just say, I hate when people read the bio when I've got you on. It's like, read the damn bio. Here's the link. I'm not going to waste your time with this. You'll find out who it is. But what do you call yourself, ufologist? Uh, I'm a historian uh, who studies UFOs. Okay. And other, and other uh, subterranean elements of our civilization. Okay, let me ask you the first question. Why is not everybody stopping what they're doing, running out into the streets and saying, they're here! They're here! Hey, How is that not possible? I've been wondering this for about 25 years since I first got into the subject. Yes. Um, and not to, not to bore you with how did I get into this all day. No, thing, no, but it's, but it's important. Yes. I, well, I think about it. I think it's interesting. Um, in the early 90s, uh, I had a different life path, and my life path was going to be teaching at some university, and that's what I thought I wanted to do as a professional historian. Uh, it was something that I enjoyed. I was studying, at the time, U.S. Cold War strategy. I wasn't quite where I am today in that whole thing, but I was uh, moving along a little path, studying Harry Truman, uh, U.S. relations with the Soviets, and so forth, and I almost fell into the subject of UFOs. I was at a bookstore and uh, just saw a UFO cover-up book, and I thought, I don't like having big question marks dangling over my head. I wanted to know, is this a real thing or is this not a real thing? And the next thing I knew, I was obsessed. I mean, totally obsessed. And um, what I thought would be a two-month little uh, research project <laughs> turned into the rest of my life. And so, yes, I mean, I uh, became early on persuaded that this was a real phenomenon, absolutely. And, and I became persuaded because of looking at uh, official declassified government documents that proved it, laid it out in black and white. And I thought, where, uh, where's the logical next step? like an acknowledgement of the reality. And that's what really gets you into the deeper analyses. Where was the media with all of this? Where was the academic community with all of this? Where's the political institutions? Are they really that controlled? How are they controlled? And so one answer led to dozens and dozens more questions. One of the questions I hate to ask is the questions that people ask me. I like to ask people, what, what statement do you want to make? What's, do, I don't want to walk around and try to find that What's that question where you say, come on, ask me this question, the one that I'm dying to say. What's the thing you want to say? What's the most important, the most important thing that you want to say? Listen, if there's one thing you've got to understand, if there's one thing that you watching this better understand and better grasp, is what? <laughs> well, relating to UFOs, I would say it's a real phenomenon. It does not appear to be from our civilization, and there's significant secrecy on this subject because it's really important. It, tr it represents a transformation of our entire civilization if we were to grasp the full implications of what it, what it represents. So I guess that's what I would say. It's real. They're here. There's a cover up. Okay. Let me ask you this now. Let me do this. This is, I like to do this technique. Let me be one of those people that I always run into to, and they, they ask me this question and, and it's really a good question. First of all, listen, Dolan, if there was something to this, it would be so obvious. Everybody on TV would want to be the next Woodward and Bernstein. It would be so obvious. Every night on TV, it's like, did you see this one? They landed. They landed. They got out. They stretched their legs. They said, beep, 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 you know, whatever it is. Look, look at this. Not an orb. Not some, you know, grainy hubcap, you know, from that. But there it is. How are you? A real up-close look at the, we've got phones that, that pick up detail. And I mean... So where's this evidence? I mean real evidence. That's what they always ask me. Well, it's a good question. It's one of the, the frustrating things about this subject. But I would just say this. Uh, in terms of evidence, there's powerful evidence if you consider a declassified government document to be evidence. <laughs> so that's, that's one thing, I guess I would say. Right. Um, um, you know, a little bit of historical background during the 50s and 60s and in the early 70s, the U.S. government was in good position because they could always say, look, you know, it's there may be interesting things about this that we don't understand, but we're really not covering anything up. We just um, just don't really know what that is, but it doesn't seem to be important. In the late 70s, after Watergate, after Vietnam, we had this Freedom of Information Act that was actually ramped up a little bit and became useful for a little while. And UFO researchers, maybe to the surprise of everyone, began to shake that tree and some documents came out. And they were uh, formerly classified documents, not the highest level, but mid-range classification that showed the government had been lying about UFOs, uh, sh showing 
violations of very sensitive airspace by objects that were not supposed to exist, described as disc-shaped back in 1947, uh, described as engaging in exceptional maneuverability, evasive maneuvers when sighted, and silent or nearly silent and so forth, um, where you, you read military documents with this utter perplexity, and then you read intelligence community analyses like CIA. One of my favorites is a late 1952 memo to the director of the CIA from his director of scientific intelligence, a guy named uh, Chadwell, who writes to Walter Beadle Smith, director of the CIA, he says, uh, the sightings of these objects at high altitudes and great speeds uh, are not attributable to natural phenomena or known types of aerial vehicles. And he went on and talked about how they were over sensitive installations and so forth. So yet you read memos like this and I just ask any any valid researcher, what are you supposed to think here? Okay. Something's happening. Let, let, um, let's start with this. I'm sorry, I'm yeah. sorry. No, no, but no, please. Photographs, photographs and things like that. I would only add there have been some good photographs. I, I have discovered it's actually difficult uh, to take a picture of a elusive high-speed object in the sky. It's not as easy as you think, but there have been objects that have been okay. captured on video and, and photographed, and I think some of them are, are valid. One of the things which I want to do, Richard, which is the most important, and I ask people this question because we, we get into sometimes this kind of a heady existential kind of talk about what, what existing is and what evidence is, and I'm a lawyer by profession, and I always ask, you know, I'm, my big thing is proof. Can you prove beyond a reasonable doubt? Now, let me tell you all the things in the world that I believe in but I can't point to. Love, electrons, illness, things like that. I make a point to sick people, and I accept things. I accept history. I accept fact. You're a historian. Tolstoy said, history would be a wonderful thing if only it were true. <laughs> I have, so I have history, and I have this. And I'm um, this morning I'm reading about uh, Iran and, and this, this contrived make-believe history of Iran by the mainstream media. Um, yeah. I'm, I mentioned electrons. I mentioned right now we're talking about string theory and supersymmetry and things that are absolutely taught in courses. So the first thing I always ask people is, what is it that you need to believe? And I don't want to get into this, but I must. I'm a retired Catholic by profession, and I never mock people's faith. But what people believe in, which is their right as an American and as a human being, absolutely astounds me. And I don't mean believe. I mean people have changed their life, give money, and have, I mean, have, they wear hats and don't eat things. And they will say, well, it is this book, fine. So within that, though, that, that, that spectrum of belief from history to electrons and religion, whatever, why is this so far-fetched? Why is this, especially when things go, mm, mm. <laughs> I mean, what? No, it, I've never um, seen St. Saint, Saint Anthony or St. Paul go like this. Or, or. I, I agree. Um, I think, uh, I, I take your point right on. I think um, the, this is not a difficult thing to believe when you just take a few steps back and look at the big picture here. This is the most yeah. critical thing. This is the thing, and, and, and there's another part too, and, and then we'll get to the facts of this, because I think sometimes the psychology of this I think it hurts people's feelings. It's like, why don't they want to talk to me? Why don't they, why, and, I, and, and we've asked the question, have you ever pulled over the side of the road, got done on all fours, gone, off, you know, gone to an anthill and explained, you know, like Stan Friedman said, you know, a fusion or something. The, the idea that we're not talked to, that somebody's not talking to us, I, I'm, you, you got to get over that. You got to just, just let, just let this yeah, go. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a strong emotional uh, connection to a lot of these issues, honestly, even in terms of belief. Um, uh, my beliefs have changed a lot over the years. Uh, I've learned over the years I don't really have strong attachments to my conclusions. I mean, there are certain things that I believe to be true, but if I turn out to be wrong, then I'll just modify my position. I mean, it's really not that, uh, not that difficult. There's a lot of pressure on public people, though, to hold certain positions. You know this easily as well as I do, but I really try to resist that. Uh, even in the UFO field, there are uh, people who like to think that they know where my position is supposed to be on something, and I'm always resistant to that. Um, in terms of this phenomenon, um, I don't really personally have a, a, a care if these other beings want to make official open contact with us or not. They seem to be uh, doing their thing. They seem to have their own agenda. I don't believe that I'll ever have a true handle on everything that they're trying to do. Right. Just as you mentioned the anthill, I think they're so far beyond whatever it is we're doing 
I, I seriously doubt that I'll ever really understand what, what they want, but uh, I can speculate. What I can say confidently is that there is an important phenomenon that is here, and there, we need a lot more smart brains on this planet under, and, uh, analyzing it than what we have right now. What we have right now is a, a system that is so rigidly controlled um, where the smartest minds on our planet are, are conditioned to think that this is a nonsensical topic. And so therefore they're not thinking about it. And really what we need is many more smart people thinking about this. And I think only then are we likely to get some uh, forward motion and understanding this. You know, the, um, the you, you mentioned this, I, I've been in the, uh, the, the kind of the news, you know, uh, whatever, whatever this thing is called, entertainment, whatever, for about 30 years. And I've found that it's almost an article of faith that if you were to report something on TV, and here in New York, we had, you know, actual, uh, and you, you can see video, YouTube filming of people seeing these orbs and these things on in Chelsea looking up, and right. there they are. Uh, that famous weird Jerusalem site where this orb flies off yes. over the Temple Mount. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the one on Fox News, no less. Fox News is like, what do you want? A little George Jetson machine? Even exactly. then, even then, they have to say, quick, don't buy into this. They say, well, you know, <laughs> I little green men. And there's this almost, there's, re, there's this reluctance to do it. What do you exactly. think? And then there's Neil deGrasse Tyson, that yeah. gatekeeper, that gatekeeper. Absolutely. Who I, and Richard, I don't know, if, and, I, and I can't swear to this, but I think they told him, listen, if you ever want to get near Hubble again, you ever want to, if you want to have your little, your little access card work on all this great, cool NASA stuff, if you so much as even hint that there's anything to this, you're through. Sagan took it from us, even Bill and I, that twit, that Correct. pseudo guy. You better laugh and talk about picking up ashtrays and, you know, just give us some evidence of this. Okay, that that being said. Well, there's a, there's a long, long-standing program that existed in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and it, it absolutely exists in a other name today. It's called Operation Mockingbird. And this was the U.S. media's long-standing collaboration with the CIA. Uh, it's well known. It's fact. Uh, anyone who's skeptical about all this can just look it up. The Washington what, Post. Washington, Washington Post. Washington Post, New York Times, CBS, all the majors collaborated actively and enthusiastically with the CIA to spin news uh, on behalf of the uh, intelligence agencies. And, and not only were they spinning news, Mockingbird involved creating uh, creation of literally fake news typically from abroad. So the CIA would create fake stories and then they would come back and be repeated to the fake U.S. public. Fake news from abroad. What was her name? That's a terrible <laughs> Now, Fake news uh, when they would, you know, right. in the, the 1950s coups and so forth that they were doing. My, my point is that uh, this is a longstanding relationship. U.S. media is deeply embedded, not just with the CIA, but with all U.S. military intelligence. The Pentagon spends countless amounts of money every year uh, managing its social image uh, with the world that includes creating a, what, what they call sock puppets, you know, on the news articles that people read, all these little trolls down there. Well, some of them, they're not just Russians, they're U.S. In fact, no what? one is better. No one's better than the United States at doing this. No one why? has ever been better. Richard Dolan, why? What are they trying? And, and don't give me this nonsense about how they're going to, we're going to run out into the street or we're going to say, we're going to, the, the calamity, we're going to turn well, cars over. What, what is the reason for the secrecy? Yeah. Uh, th this, this, I believe, I at least have an idea, and I don't know that this is true, but uh, I, all I can do is try to rewind the clock back to the 1940s and, and see the situation as it as it probably developed. So let's say you're the president, Harry Truman, your top people have come to you and said, sir, this is real. Not only is it real, but we seem to have recovered some of their technology and maybe bodies, if you think that something like Roswell happened, which I do. Um, of course. So, so in that situation, you, the president, have to make a really important decision. Do you tell the world or not? You, you might want to tell the world, but then your people would say, bad idea. Not only do you not know are they friend or foe? What's the deal? You have no ability to resolve this to the public. You've got one big open-ended issue here, but also this technology. Do you want to share it with the Russians? Do you want to share it with whomever? And you might not want to do that. America did not want to share its atomic technology in 1947, which was a very big public issue at the time. Very big issue. 
Um, it's a little known fact in 1947, 48, the United Nations was knocking at the door of the U.S. saying atomic technology is so important. You, you should this should be under international control. And America was like, no, thank you. We'll keep this to ourselves. Now, you, um, you, I'm, I'm so sorry. They, they wouldn't want to share something as exotic as alien tech is all I'm saying. You right. would create a secrecy industry. 1947 was a watershed year. Uh, it was uh, uh, Arnold, right? It was his name, Arnold, who coined, who, who, who was mis misquoted. He said they. Yes, Kenneth he Arnold. Was, yeah, he was uh, he was flying around and he uh, he saw these things around Seattle or something and he saw they looked like saucers that could skip but somehow from that they get flying saucers right yeah. around then Roswell right around that then you have uh, Washington and these things L A they're shooting anti aircraft fifteen hundred rounds American military. You sure as hell better be. I mean, I, I those things oh, landed. Yeah. They landed somewhere. So I, I don't know if all of a sudden there's some yeah, yeah. leaf collector in Vancouver who all of a sudden says, "Oh, look a maple," and he's hit by this fusillade of of uh, whatever. So, forty seven. What was that year? I mean, it was it was they they were busy and well, please. A couple of those things didn't happen in 47. Not that. Whatever. That just pretend, was, damn it. Just. The, the L.A. thing was in 42, early World War II. Excuse uh, me. The Washington sightings were a little later. But but um, but in 47, 48, 49, 50, it was uh, actually it was hot and heavy with a lot of UFO sightings and military encounters through all of those years. And so what is what did uh, happen? And again, we can only speculate, but uh, a lot of people do think. There have been a lot of UFO sightings over nuclear facilities, and maybe the current uh, best speculation is that it had to do with the fact that we, as humanity, jumped to the next level of our technology, that is having nuclear weapons, and maybe that got someone's attention. But honestly, Lionel, I couldn't tell you. I don't know exactly Thank you. why. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. I hate when people read into it. And they wanted to come and give us some messages. <laughs> Stop it. You don't even know what these people were about. But let me just say, though, that the, 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 the stories, for those who don't realize this, is that for Area, well, not Area 51, but Roswell, mm -hmm. there were a lot of people who were told, if you say anything about this, you will be disappeared. You will be, you'll yes. be, and now for something not to appear, I've never had, and, and I know the military has got a lot of free time. But to go and knock on people's doors and say, you know, this thing that didn't happen, this thing that I'm making up. Well, if you ever tell anybody about the thing that didn't happen, that doesn't make any sense. Something happened. That's, I, I spoke to one uh, witness. She's an elderly uh, lady now. But uh, when she was a young girl, she was one of those people who was threatened um, in exactly that manner. What do you think of Stan uh, Friedman? Stan Friedman interviewed mm -hmm. all these people. What is your, your, your take on him? Your, your thoughts? Oh, well, Stan and I, I've known him for many years and we're friends and colleagues. Uh, um, I have tremendous respect for Stanton's work. Uh, you know, he's the guy who back in the seventies was, uh, uh, talking about these release freedom of information act documents and, uh, filling in the blanks. He's the first major investigator of Roswell uh, brought that out into the public domain. He studied what are infamously known as, <clears throat> excuse me, as the MJ-12 documents, right. which uh, are controversial. But, but like Stanton, I, I support uh, at least, it's hard to say. I mean, I support the validity of of, uh, of most of those documents in my view. I think that they're uh, way too sophisticated just to have been cranked out of someone's basement. So if they're an intelligence operation, then it's highly sophisticated and we have to ask for what reason. Anyway, Stanton's done great work, and I, um, I admire him. What about what about Greer? What do you think of him? Steve, I know what you're going to say. Go ahead, say it. Well, look, I, I, um, I feel like everyone has had, uh, has, you know, Greer has done some positive things that I will always uh, uh, look back on. I think was a good thing. So I, I support his uh, 2001 press conference that he did in Washington, D.C. I think it was uh, an amazing accomplishment, to be honest with you, to get uh, over a thousand people in Washington at the National Press Club to um, uh, have an enormous disclosure event on, on but the he's, reality. he's kind of gone off the reservation, Lee. I don't know what he's, he, he, I mean, he's something like Stanton, because I've noticed, and, and, and this is not an appraisal, Stanton's very, very, um, and, and I love the, I love him because he's like the granddaddy of this. He started right. this when I was born. 
So I mean, he he knows his stuff, but he's he's he and he's very limit. He's very, for example, Bob right, Lazar. Right. Bob Lazar, for example, another one. He keeps saying, "Well, you know, Bob Lazar did not go to MIT." Okay, fine, but could Bob Lazar be telling the truth? Well, you yes. know, we checked we checked Bob Lazar's records. Yes, I know you checked the records. I never said so, he was okay. that. Right, so let's could, we'll go with that. So I I don't agree with Stan on Lazar. Um, I got to meet Lazar a couple of years ago, but even aside from that, I, I did as much investigation of the Bob Lazar story as I was able to, and I was satisfied that Lazar was uh, fundamentally truthful. Do you know, let me say the bigger thing, as a prosecutor, do you know about Lazar, the thing that gets me, you know his story never changes? And this is a guy yeah. who, by the way, is not, he was rather reluctant, he says, look, I'm trying to sell my nuclear isotopes, whatever the hell he's trying to do, leave me alone. And uh, I knew he was on Nori. Who was the who was the uh, El, the Las Vegas reporter? He's very very George good. Knapp. Yes, George Knapp. Reluctantly pulls him in. For somebody who's okay, he didn't go to MIT. Fine, okay, I got it. But for somebody yeah. who is making this up whole cloth, the idea of of how just the propulsion thing is what blows my mind. Taking, no, I taking gravity. Uh, space. I, I agree. Dimpling it, divoting it, falling. I, I, I'm just. I. He's. 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 I don't his want to say. His story has never changed. I. I like you. I read uh, probably every one of his transcripts from his interviews from the late '80s, early '90s, and they never varied, not one bit. He never overstepped. He never went beyond. Um, he was always very meticulously careful about it. And I. I agree with you, um, and for a lot of other reasons, I. I support that he was there. Um, just back to Greer, and I don't want to uh, get involved in trash talking with other people in this field, but that's not what we're doing. That's not, by the way, that's not no, no, what we're no. doing. But but it's easy for me to criticize some other researchers. So when I, I criticize, I just want to say it's I I support someone if they can provide me with evidence that I can relate to. What I can't relate to is when someone says I have this inside source that tells me such and such a thing, and I have no ability to um, to follow up. So. Some of that happens with Greer. There are other researchers, they do the same thing. And we all get uh, inside sources, by the way. We all get people that sometimes we can't reveal them, but you've got to be careful with that sort of well, thing. Well, let me tell you what my, my thing is, and, and, and it's not, and I'm not saying it's wrong, because you've got to be very, very careful, because you have to have a degree of, dare I say, sobriety when you do this. And, and you must, not, not that you're not drunk, but you must be sober and direct and very methodical very and very very um, uh, analytical, and don't stray off the reservation in terms of what people want in humankind. Don't read into how we as a human being and the energy, stop it, mm. stop with this stuff. But th th there, he was very, very good to hear people, when he did the, the original press club, to hear people like your granddad coming up and saying, hi, I'm a nuclear, they put me, I guess I'm not crazy, I was in charge of, you know, um, uh, I was doing, um, uh, yeah, what's the word for it? I can't even think now, but he's doing radar. Basically, I'm at an Air Force base yeah. and I'm in charge mm -hmm. of, and I'm basically looking at this and I've got my reports and there's this big hulking fellow and I saw this and I measured it and wow, this is going like 25,000 miles per hour and these people have no reason to lie. They're just... Right, exactly. These are yeah. radar texts. Now, the, the, the last one I must ask you about, and I, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name. This is the fellow who would take the podiatrist who died fairly recently. Yeah, Dr. Roger Lear. Now, if he... I believe him. Now, am I, am I a lunatic? This man is like he's taking no. things out. He's he says, "Here I am." Somebody comes in and says, "There's something in my foot." He does a flor fluoroscopy. He says, "There's a piece of metal. There's no incision. There's no entry point. There's no trauma. Here it is. I take it out. It's covered in organic material. I send it off. It it, it come. I I, well, I believe Lear, him. He um. It's it, uh. Lear worked with a, a fellow. Uh, Lear passed away, unfortunately. He worked with a man named Dr. Alex Mosier, who's a PhD in electro um, engineering, I think. And um, they did a lot of work together. So, so Lear is the surgeon. He would take these objects out of people's feet. Mosier is the guy who was really skilled at doing deep analyses of these objects. And um, on one occasion, they discussed, they had about... Um, eight or nine of these, they said they were exactly identical. You could have laid them out in a surgical drape. You couldn't have told them, taken them apart, uh, told them apart. 
they did an analysis of one of them in great detail and they found that it gave off a radio frequency. They also found uh, that it was embedded in organic material. They found that it was uh, extremely difficult to cut. This is a less than the size of a right. grain of rice. Uh, there were other specific things that, that uh, convinced them that this was manufactured and it was of an exceptionally high uh, level of technology, something that they didn't really understand. This is like out of the X-Files, except it's real. Um, and the only problem that they had is having access to serious money, serious labs that could really take this to the next level. But the analyses that they've done, uh, I, I thought was really, really superb from um, from everything that they uh, explained. And Lear unfortunately died, and uh, I don't know who's carrying on that work. Well, he was, and he also, by virtue, and I believe in just reading people like I would read a witness. If I would present him to a jury, they would listen to him and say, oh, I, I believe this fellow. Also, mm -hmm. Dr. Mack, uh, John Mack, I believe, Harvard yeah. psychiatrist, who yes. did who did deep, who wasn't necessarily a believer, who did hypnosis and found case after case. In fact, Alan Dershowitz had to come to his defense when they wanted to bounce him out of Harvard because it's like, you right. can't say there was abductions. I have no reason. He says, look, don't believe me. Here's the recording. Here's what they said. I'm, I'm, I'm a Harvard psychiatrist. You believe in hypnosis. It's okay when it comes to me trying to figure out what happens with, you know, with a crime or some traumatic event. But when it comes to this subject matter, again, it's that, no, 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 don't, don't talk about this. We, so these were very, very critical people who I think sometimes the first thing people do is try to deliberately, it's like, look at this guy, Lear. What's with the mustache? It was like, what's with the mustache? He's just a podiatrist. He's a surgeon. What are you, and you've heard this, I'm sure. People don't want to believe this. There's like, there's this allergy they have to this, this resistance. Well, I, I, um, I agree with you, but I would just add, I think um, in general, like when I deal with the, the public, uh, I find that people, once they discover like the things that I study, they they're kind of into it. They want to know more. Oh no, they are. And uh, I would say ninety percent of the people are willing to listen to me talk about this because they realize, oh, this guy knows a little bit about the subject. I want to know because it's curious. And they, um, I can always see the look on their face after I talk with them for five ten minutes. They're into it. So I don't think that there's that much resistance, but I do think there's tremendous powerful resistance from the established that's it uh, what, what right. we'll call the officially established culture right and people generally don't want to fight that as official culture because they don't want to look stupid they when they see someone in authority like like neil degrasse tyson making fun of this which he does all the time or bill nye ridiculous oh. um they they uh, they are not inclined to go against that so there's this cultural imperative and it comes down uh, I think it's related exactly to programs like Mockingbird and uh, whatever successor programs they have. Collaboration between the intelligence community and the media. But the word is to to debunk this again and again and again. There is something also. There is a um, there is a resistance, much like. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why these objects were were the Dr. Lear pulled. I would imagine the reason why they were coated in some kind of an organic material was to prevent rejection, inflammation, yeah. rejection. So it kind of makes sense. But I, and I don't want to go into this, but, and I've never seen anything even remotely that I would call a UFO. I've never seen an electron either. So I've never had a moment. Have you? Was there a moment uh, of yours? I, I did on two occasions, not including one, a uh, couple of nights with night vision uh, glasses, which I was uh, privileged to use. But yeah, on two occasions, um, both after I started researching the subject. So I got into the subject on purely intellectual research uh, basis. But um, about um, 18 years ago, I was with my son, who was then three years old, and right in front of my house here in Rochester, New York, uh, in a perfect blue sky, I saw an object that I could not explain. It was so intensely bright. Uh, I looked away for one second, and it, it disappeared. And uh, I've never figured that one out since. And then on another occasion... I was with my family uh, in the early evening, again in my neighborhood, jokingly saying, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we looked up and saw a UFO? My daughter and I looked up and I saw the most extraordinary, fast moving object zooming across the sky. I don't know what that was. It went into a thin cloud and never came out. Do you know how many people do not look up? 
I'll give you the story. Right. Year, years right. ago, I knew this this uh, this old old man who decided to hide his money in a bag and he put it in a tree. And I said, "Why did you put it in a tree? Why not bury it?" He says, "Who looks up in a tree? Do you ever do that?" I said, "No." He says, "People don't look up," and I never forgot that. And how many times have you said, "No, no, wait, hold it, Richard, Richard, we gotta we gotta go to the doctor." No, no, wait, honey, wait. <laughs> Richard, stop it. Richard, we got to go. No, no, I'm just looking. Nobody looks up. Not only that, I looked out of my window here, looking down New York, Manhattan, and one night I saw this, it looked like the proverbial Venus. It's Venus. Mm-hmm. Or swamp gas or weather balloon. So I set up a tripod, my, my camera, and I looked at it, and this orb was here. Just, it was just, I don't know what it was. Then it's over here. Not moving, I just came back and looked. I said, it moved, because I could see the positioning, and I just took a clip picture, click, click, and it's oh, just Oh, that's going. interesting. Now, huh? That's interesting. Now, that's interesting. But it's not moving. It's just, now, and I got my phone. I said, Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said it was moving. My mistake. Oh, no, no. It was <clears throat> moving, but not, I couldn't see it. I oh, right. Would, okay. I would see it two minutes later. It's over here. I don't think I a, anything is moving that quickly. I looked to see where Venus was, nowhere to be found. Now, could that be? I don't know. So I've never seen anything. I've never uh, seen it's, something. It's that, very easy for us to be misled by uh, astronomical phenomena. It really is true. And that's what I'm doing. Right. Venus so and other. Um, so we have to be careful. On one occasion, I had a, a sighting where I did the same thing. I put my camera on the top of my car, and I discovered that was an ordinary object that looked like it was moving. So there's um, and you were driving, which which made it which made it tough because you says because your wife says, "Honey, right. put the camera inside the car. Stop Easy doing that. Be, the neighbors be, are watching." So, but <laughs> um, but um, anyway, I you know the sightings that I had were not all that extraordinary. I've talked to people who've had way more interesting sightings than me, but um, again, it just comes down to the fact uh, my sightings are not important, and I don't really judge my experience on the phenomenon based no, on what I saw. But it's important to know for people to ask people to, that people should, um, you know, you don't, you don't see a lot of um, atheists writing books about miracles and, you know, in a positive way, like Lord, right, this is right. a wonderful thing. Are you, a, do you, do you believe in this? Oh no, you don't normally see that. But what people forget is that by virtue of the human visual spectrum, we can we can see virtually nothing. We can see the microscopic. We can't see the far away. We can't see the ultraviolet. We can't see the infrared. We can't see. We see virtually nothing. And you mentioned um, a night vision. Why do we think that things that appear come from someplace where, in fact, they could be here, but at a different, for lack of a better word, energy level or a yeah. different phase where we don't see it, or all of a sudden because you've seen these. You see them, now you see them, now you don't. Or you see two orbs combined and then separate. Something that does not, it's not the take me to your leader I, type of format. I, uh, I completely agree with you. Um, I think someone told me Michio Kaku had this idea. Excuse but me, I had it, Gesundheit. Had it. <laughs> the, uh, the idea that we're kind of like in a fishbowl. Um, anyway, the, think, of it, think of fish in a little, uh, in a little pond and, um, and someone who goes into the pond and the fish are... They might vaguely perceive that there's someone there, but they don't really understand what that person is. They don't understand that there's land. They don't understand that there's a sky or that there's stars in space because they're fish. They live in their little pond. So in a sense, we're we're fish. And our pond, you might say, would be our space-time reality. And I know this sounds a little weird, but space and time are uh, are not what our common sense tell us. Space and time are a fabric. That's why we have the phrase space-time fabric. And they can be affected by things. And and um, any physicist will tell you that our universe has a point of origin. They call it the Big Bang. And prior to the Big Bang, there was no, there was no prior to the Big Bang because there was no time. And we go, huh? How does that make sense? My point is simply that space and time are a little bit more complex than our common sense tells us. Our our perceptual abilities are really amazing, but they are still limited. Well, so, like Stephen Hawking said, before the Big Bang is like saying south of the South Pole. Doesn't make any sense. There's no before the there, there's right, exactly. no begin but, the begin. We want to think. We want to think that there's a before because that's how our brains work. We want to think that space just goes and goes and goes, but that's not apparently that's not how reality is. So my only point is that we have our own limits to what we are able to perceive. And so if there are other intelligences, which I believe that there are, who have a greater ability to enter or leave our reality, as it were, 
then we wouldn't be able to compete with them. We wouldn't be able to deal with them or understand them fully. They could enter and leave our reality as we understand it, and we would never really get a, a full grasp of what they are. And my personal opinion is that that's what's going on. Now, Michio Kaku, I think, is so close to saying yes. He's like he's he's almost like Jeremiah Denton when he was you know the POW who was blinking like I'm I'm being tortured. Uh, <laughs> Mid, Michio was saying no no really I, this is as close as I can I'm I'm not tenured yet I, or or maybe this he is, is this is a guy that you'd love to get alone at a at yes. over a beer and get him to talk about this because and I this think is you're somebody right. I like to get also like a lot of airplane pilots to say no listen you're retired now right yeah it's okay mm-hmm. it's okay because you know and I know. <laughs> These people must have stories. Let's play a thought experiment. Yes. Can you imagine if one day we bring in one of these quitters? If I said, Richard, you're not going to believe this. I got one of these here. And you talk to him. First of all, would he or she? And is it, are there many, many, just using either evidence that you have or what you believe, is there one version of these things? Are they the tall Swedish Dolph Lundgren looking types? Are they the typical ovoid almond? What do you think? Is there a physical manifestation? Do they talk? Is it telepathy? Do they have? <laughs> I mean, let's let's talk about the silly stuff like what do you think yeah. they look like? So tough because uh, when you really go through the long history of, of alleged encounters that people have, it's all over the map. So uh, most of the beings are humanoid in that they've got two, leg, two legs, two arms, and a head. So they've got the same basic body plan that we have, uh, but they may look different. They may be short. Some In the 1950s, there were a bunch of ones in South America that were said to be hairy and powerful and muscular. Then you get the little guys with the big heads, the grays. Um, you get the humanoid types. You get insect-like creatures that people describe. You get the reptoid types of beings. And it's uh, enough to make you crazy when you really think, all right, does this make any sense? And I don't, I don't know how to put this all together, um, except to say that um, it, it would be possible to think that a, uh, an intelligence would have the ability to genetically manipulate a variety of life forms for their own purposes. I'm just putting that out there. I don't really know. We ourselves are at the point where we're about to be able to essentially create uh, mod- you- genetically modify all kinds of life forms ourselves uh, using a combination of uh, complete mastery of the genome, AI, nanotech. Yes. And, and you could probably put something, 3D printing, organic 3D printing. They could probably put something together. Uh, maybe that's what they're doing. Maybe it's one civilization that creates all of these different do you, uh, do beings, you see- or maybe there's different ones. I, You know, ki- kids, kids today, I sound like my grandfather but the word awesome is used far far too much what is awesome what i am in awe about is the idea of thinking like holy mother of god this blows my mind ai makes me like that this is what people who are religious must feel like i always want to have this thought experiment this 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 idea where i said there's a richard bear with me this one I got one of these. And he comes in, he's a great guy, and we give him a name. And he tells you something telepathically. Tell me again how you fly. Yes, we have these rockets. <laughs> and you what? Well, we burn, you burn chemical. I've heard about that. You burn solid state. <laughs> really? Yeah. And he makes a lot of noise and smoke. And wow. You can't go faster than the speed of light. Who said that? <laughs> well, that's what we heard. I mean, I uh, I want to hear because let's face it, the Earth, our Earth is seven point five whatever billion years old, or roughly, at seventy five hundred million years. So if there was one little planet, we always talk about planets, but if there was something, if there was something that was seventy five hundred and one million, it's a million years ahead of us. From nineteen hundred and three, Kitty Hawk to nineteen sixty nine, landing on the moon. Well, whatever. But anyway, in sixty six years, look how we did. So imagine a million. Yeah. And imagine if somebody came along and said, cancer? We had cancer. Oh, cancer. We don't have cancer anymore. Why are you eating that? Why are you doing that? And if I had to explain to them, I said, we, we kill, sometimes kill each other about these wars. This war business, explain this to me. And better yet, I'm going to take you to the Pope. And the Pope says, guess what? 
We believe, in fact, the Vatican has said this. We believe these folks may not have original sin. Now dig this. They may not mm -hmm. need to be saved. They may not have the sting, the stain, that mark of original sin. They may not need to be redeemed. I mean, do you know what this would be? Hey, Joel Osteen, blow it out your ass. They're not, you know, they're not, they, they don't <laughs> need to be saved. Do you understand that? They haven't done, the, 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 this business about you're the only ones, think about that. Personally, I would love to say, okay, deal with that one. But what if somebody could say, we all have the same universe. We basically have the same chemicals. We kind of have the same gravity and things. Right. But let me show you what we figured out. And, yeah. and to bring in Edward Witten or Terrence Tao, Mathem, and have their jaws drop, string theorists, supersymmetry, quantum, and have them be laughed at. String theory? <laughs> That's the uh, part... One little mental uh, game that I, I, have to, I like to play with myself is uh, imagine just an ordinary group of people going back in time 2,000 yes. years or even 1,000 years to some medieval village um, or maybe finding the, the most intelligent person in an area, maybe the, maybe the abbot of a monastery and you, you meet this person. What could we tell them yes. about our world? Almost nothing. Could you tell them that the, earl, the, the world is a sphere? Maybe. Could you tell them that, that there's this tectonic plates and that uh, the continents move? I don't think so. Could you tell them about germs or microbes? I don't think so. You would be burned as a heretic. You would be uh, arrested. It would be, it would be impossible. Exactly. Could and we Galileo, tell our, you would our, say, Galileo. Or our, our, phone, our iPhones or our tablets or our technology or the right. things that we're able to do. Absolutely no way. I mean, we would completely destroy their civilization if they uh, if they were to see some of the things that we would be able to do. Um, so that would be a problem. So now we're dealing with, let's say, other beings that are more than a thousand years advanced from us. I'm sure that they. I mean, we would be the same species as uh, these people a thousand years ago, when we still wouldn't be able to talk with them. So what could a different species be able to communicate to us? I doubt very much at all. Um, one of the, the other things that I like to think about is uh, when people like to think about the motivations of these other beings and they assume that they're peaceful. People like uh, Dr. Greer assumes that these other beings are peaceful. Yeah. And I, and I, I question this because, you know, we go back to uh, a medieval village and we show them our, our nice little technology and our, our nice clothing and our great health. And they might think, wow, you guys have figured it all out. You probably figured out how to solve all of your social problems and, we would just look at each other and not say a word. Yeah. Uh, so in other words, advanced technology doesn't in any way mean that you're nice. It doesn't mean that you're not rapacious. It doesn't but mean But let me say this. But let me say, but, 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 but you're right, though. But it may not be rapacious. It may not be not nice. It may be we have collected a series of these cells in a Petri dish. It's like, you bastard! It's like, no, no, mm. no, no. Well, I've, I've taken a sample of this. Yo, but he has a name! What? We may not be, it may be, well, I want to take them, and I, I've got this Dolan, and I'm going to put one of these things in his foot and see where he goes, and I might take one of these eggs, and let's see if we can cross. Right, I right. Mean, they might have a different, uh, uh, they might not be evil, they just may look at the world or look at the universe in a totally different way than we do. And if you're the recipient, do. but if you're the recipient of that experimentation, you you may not take too kindly as somebody taking your left testicle to be, it's like nothing personal, Richard. We just want a, a sample. <laughs> it's like wait a minute, that's my balls. You're you know to 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 bring it to a more uh, a base a level. But you see, this is the part that I'm telling people you're missing the fun. You're missing the fun of this. You're missing the idea of, oh my, the idea of somebody saying, okay, Dolan, watch this. Come on. I know what you want to do. You want to go fly with me. All right, come on. Put this on. What is it? It's a suit. It looks like a skin tight thing. Put this bed, you know, Philip Corso, bless his heart. I don't know if he, I, look, I, I, I love his idea. I love to think that they've got, vats of you know green people floating in formaldehyde but the i there's a little bit about taking retro engineering and finding you know uh, uh, night vision goggles and that but imagine yeah. if i said okay dollar watch this ready now put this thing on now 
we're in this little, you're, you're, you're a little large for our machine here, or as Lazar calls it, the sport model. But we, 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 we'll, we'll make a seat for you. Now, put your hands here. Now, think. Your body is a transistor. Where do you want to go? We're in our own inertial system. Watch this. You want to haul ass? Watch how we do this. Now, let's, let's assume, I hope nothing's in our way, but we're going to use gravity. We're going to make this dimpled, divot little, and we're going to fall. And watch this. You're going to, you're going to, shit. And you're doing what again with planes? You're, you're, you're taking off and you're, that's the part that I just marvel. What is that tooling about? And saying, look, I got one better. Forget speed. Let's just go into a different form. Where do you want to go? Mm -hmm. I want to go over there. Let's crinkle. If we're at a long table, and there's a, 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 a tablecloth, and the salt shaker is way down there, I could get up and walk over, or I could crinkle and pull. Yeah. The, you know, I can do all kinds. That's what I want to see. I think, yeah, I think they figured out a way to, to um, manipulate space and time in ways that we just haven't figured out yet. I, I think it's entirely possible that we can get to that point, that we could do this. Uh, and I believe that these other beings, uh, that's what they do. They're able to um, understand and, and manipulate the space-time fabric in, in uh, important ways that uh, maybe we're tw 10, 20, 30, 50 years away from this. I don't know. But I think that uh, that's what they're doing. And has, we, anybody ever come to you, has anybody ever hmm? come to you? Has anybody come to you, Richard, for example, you get a knock on the door? Honey, there's a man here. He's wearing a trench coat. And he says... Dolan, I want to talk to you about something. I have a clearance you've never heard of. It's one of those five Umbra Ultra whatever. And we want to talk to you about something. You know, uh, and of course you can't tell me this ever happened, but it would seem to me that if I was trying to maintain these secrets, I would do something to quell the excitement from people. Or would I let you go? Would I say, go ahead, talk about it. We're the Pentagon. We've got nothing to hide. Enjoy your little talks, your yeah. new move on things, and let us know if you find anything. Well, it's, it's funny you ask. I mean, long before we had Edward Snowden, who proved that you know NSA is monitoring everything, CIA is monitoring everything. Um, I I know for a fact that in the early 2000s, I was having all kinds of issues and monitoring issues with my internet and all of this stuff. I had a Time Warner guy come into my house and say, "I don't know what you're into, man, but you've got some weird stuff going on here." I said, well, look at my books. Is <laughs> that everything to do with it? Do with it. Um, and I, I had odd uh, white vans hanging out in front of my house for uh, several years uh, that would just take off when I would come out to talk to them. Uh, that stopped. I used to get stopped at airports for a couple of years um, in the uh, 2004, 2005 period, 2006. But I really haven't had any. Um, I haven't had anyone who's threatened me. I've had no one who's uh, talked to me. I've had a lot of. Uh, people within um, different parts of the government and the intelligence community who've, who've talked to me as uh, supporting me, uh, who like what I have to say. I've had no one um, dismiss me or, or um, try to threaten me, but I don't really think that I'm that. I, I have I have some people who follow me, but I'm I'm not a big mainstream guy, and I don't really have a big following. So uh, maybe that's why. Well, <laughs> you will now. But, uh, it, you know, there, there's, this, there's this part, too, which, which nobody wants to talk about. You do realize that there are some wonderful people, well-intended, well wonderful people, Richard, who are out of their minds, who, remember SCTV years ago was a precursor? Yes. Okay, SCTV was complete genius. I was a big fan. Oh, and there was a fellow, Vic Hedges, Gene Flaherty, I think was running, he played this, this neighborhood tough or whatever, and he ran for mayor. And his motto was, Vic Hedges, Sure, he's crazy, but what if he's right? Okay, well, <laughs> you know and I know you must meet people who are sometimes out of their gourd. However, sometimes in order to fully embrace things, you have to put your clutch into your imagination, let your engine spin, and sometimes they're kind of better able maybe to appreciate it. They, of course, can't put on the right shoe or hold down a job, but... Mm -hmm. So you meet these people, and then there are some sure. who are into the, the star, crystally kind of a new agey. It's like, okay, fine. Same thing with anything. You get, you know, uh, the modified atheist, the crazy atheist. 
But there's something about if you get everybody aside and you say, come here, now listen to me. Is there any part of you? And they will say, you know, yeah. I mean, they always say this. I mean, there's got to be something. We can't be alone. That's how you get them. You start off with that. We can't be alone. We can't possibly be. There was one called Rare Earth or something, a book that suggested, no, we're really the only people out oh, here. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, fine. Good for you. That was a nice one. Uh, but so deep, and, and if you say how many of you have seen something, their hands will go up, but how many of you reported it? Not at all. Right. This is something that is... Again, I started off with this. Why everybody is not fascinated by this, I will never know. Um, UFOs, there's a lot of other issues in this world uh, where you just think everyone should be aware of these things, and yet there's no conversation about it. But I, I actually, um, I'm convinced that people, there's a hunger for truth that people have. They they can't always conceptualize it. They, right. they can feel it in their bones. They know there's something desperately wrong with the way that this world is in a lot of ways. They know that the reality that they're getting from their official news sources are are somehow not right, but they can't, because most people, they have to work a nine to five. They have got responsibilities, they got things to do. They don't have time to analyze the system or much less fight the system. But there's a very few people who actually dedicate the time to figuring out the world. And it's it's hard, it's hard work, but they know there's something wrong and they want they want that truth, and they know that it's there. Right. Um, what what um, sometimes is really shocking to me when I think about it is I look at myself. I've spent my whole life, like you, I'm trying to understand how this world works, and I've been lucky. I haven't had to work for another company. I've, I've figured out a way to support myself barely, but I do it, and I and I um, is, I continue to study, and I continue to learn, and I still feel there is so much. Oh, it's oh, so yes. It's so difficult. Oh, and. And even now I'm thinking, holy cow, I didn't even realize, like, I'm learning new things all the time. Right. And, and if it's hard enough for me who dedicates myself to this, I just think, um, how is it for most people? Well, it's very difficult for most Stop people. For, I have, Stop for I have one friends. second. Stop. Do you know how lucky you are? You know, I tell people all the time, and it's true. You see, well, little little uh, little Dickie's going to college. I'm thinking, oh, my God. It's like, listen, kid, you're not going to understand this when I tell you this, but you're not going to start learning until later on. You don't even know what learning is. You're going to go, and you're going to start remembering because what you're doing is you're remembering stuff. You remember what this one said and that, and then you repeat back what you remembered. But there is nothing more human than to know something. And there is something, there's nothing more daunting and humbling than to realize, I don't know shit about Boy, anything. So true. I know so more true. than, I, Albert Einstein, supposedly, maybe apocryphal, the little girl says, Mr. Einstein, I'm so stupid. He goes, you think you're stupid. You don't know your math. I don't know the universe. And I've, I, I, I love words, and I love being a sesquipedalian, and I realize I'll never even get near this. But it's wonderful. There's a, it keeps you alive. It keeps you young. It keeps your, your mind fecund and fertile. And no, I, I love that. But, yeah, I feel so unequal uh, to the task of all the questions that I love to research. Um, you know, if I can get, like, a small amount, a tiny amount uh, resolved, I'll, I'll consider myself very Who? lucky. Who but are some of the people I love, that I love? Hmm? I'm sorry. No, please, no what's your ahead. question? Well, I just I love the the whole. Pro I think to me the the great reward is just, just the journey itself, and uh, you know going into the UFO field has opened up a whole world of other questions and um, and really enabled me to just to, uh, to to it's it's asking the questions that makes my uh, my time in my life worthwhile. Who blow in in conclusion? Is who blows your mind? Who you know they ask Sinatra. When you're at home, whom do you listen to? What what's on your hi-fi, as it were? Who are the people that you follow that blow your mind? Your your heroes, the ones that we should be wow. watching as well. Thanks for asking. Well, um, you know, I love I love the past, so um, I'm a big fan of. Uh, you're gonna laugh, but I I read Marcus Aurelius Meditations probably uh, every week. I want to party uh, with you, my friend. Uh, you I, must I, be a wild man. Well, at the picnic, I don't know, Marcus but, Aurelius is like that. Dolan, he's uh, Marcus Aurelius on, is Marcus. awesome. He's he's fantastic. Um, I like reading a lot of ancient. I'm reading um, actually Carol Quigley's uh, yes. Tragic Hope. Tragedy right Hope. Oh yes. Oh, which the, I'm really the left, the left really right paradigm. Yes, yes. 
Um, yeah, yeah. I, and I'm, I, a, I'm a huge, I have a huge man crush on Abraham Lincoln. Always have, always will. I think Lincoln's amazing. I've studied, uh, probably read every piece of correspondence he's ever written, and um, and I, I read Lincoln over and over again. There's a, um, you know, I, it's, it's funny you say this, there, there, there are people out there in the world, and by virtue of this, do you realize there you are in Rochester, as we say, home of Wegmans originally, I think. Yes. I'm not sure. And here I am. I was talking yesterday to my friend Peter Lavelle in Moscow. This is Dick Tracy and Flash Gordon. Here I am at my table, and you're at home, and we're doing this, and we're just two minds connected. This still blows my mind. I still can't get used to this. And I talked to friends of mine. Oh, yeah, what we're doing here, this whole thing. Oh, Absolutely. Oh, oh this, this, this is so cosmic. So, and somewhere... I think Mork and Orca, whoever is looking down, saying, you know, I think those two got it. We got to talk to them. They get it. They get it. It's like we were, we were put on this planet by virtue of the fact that there's this innate curiosity for some reason. And I've known people. Jackie Gleason was one. Ronald Reagan was one. I've known people who all their yeah, lives yeah. are focused. It's like somebody touched them. Somebody along the way... And I'm kind of late to the game and this, and I'm still, I, I, I don't even know what it was that finally flipped my switch. But I'm a, amazed by how people are not curious as to what you would, many, many, many people call conspiracy theories. I right. was here in New York on 9-11 and I saw, I saw this and how people rewrote the laws of physics to this day blows huh. my mind. So I meet those people a little bit of these people. Later on today, I'm going to be talking to uh, David Knight from Alex Jones, talking to Alex. And Alex stays away from this. I don't know why. Some people no, are like, I, oh, I no. know. I, he does. He, he, uh, nine, my dad worked at the World Trade Center. My dad was a retired New York City cop. Uh, wow. I'm from New York myself. Uh, after he retired, he uh, worked for seven years at the World Trade Center as a fire safety director. He had Tuesdays off on the day of 9-11, so he wasn't there. The man he shared his job with was killed that day. Um, I knew that man. I was at night. I used to go to the World Trade Center myself many times. I loved that place. And then it went away. And um, uh, like you, I've really thought a lot about it. Um, I think that might have been one of the reasons why I got stopped at airports, because around 2004 was when I started talking publicly about 9-11 and how I did not believe and will not ever believe the official story of it. Till my dying breath, I will never believe the official story of 9-11. But you can't. But see... It's insulting. But it is, it is insulting. insulting. But also, I tell people, here are my rules. People that I bring into this... I call my world the conspiratorium. And we are the clarity. We're like this high, the high priest of this, this cabal. And like Gore Vidal says, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a conspiracy analyst. And I'm Thank anal you. And I'm Big analyzing. Big fan of Gore Vidal. And he, yes. And, I, and, and, and I'm analyzing this. But... When you say, you know what, that case stinks, this, the, the facts stink, whether it's UFOs or 9-11 or Building 7 or yeah. whatever it is, that doesn't mean you have, and therefore, it was Pakistan. It's like, whoa, 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 wait. There is no, no right. therefore. Another thing, too, is it's not my story. I try to tell people this. It's not your story. When somebody says crop circles, oh, by the way, I must ask you, crop circles, yay or nay? Anything to that? Yeah, I think yes. I think some of the crop circles are pretty, pretty darn interesting. You're I mean, nuts. I know that they're you're, human you're artists. You're crazy. You're crazy. You're nuts. It was some guy with a board. It was a drunk guy in Canada with a plank. <laughs> even though, even though some of these were like twelve miles long, and they're, and they're amazing. He, they're he incredible. could not. He could not have seen the ellipse. All right, Jerry, to the left. That's some, it. Some of them, there are some very good human creators of crop circles, and we un understand how they do it, and they use their own GPS, and I get it. But some of these circles were incredibly intricate back in the late 80s, and um, and no one's ever been caught doing it. That's Have the you thing. ever seen one of these things form? Now, I saw something. Video, yeah. A video, and I don't even know how, I don't even know what it was, but I never thought, does it start over here? It's almost like imagine a fan that's over this and and they like this particular type of wheat. But let me go back to what I was saying. So I tell yeah. people, remember, you don't have to fill in the blanks. For example, if you say, you know, I don't believe. I have to have a hard time with the, heart, with the, the official story of 9-11. Oh, yeah? Well, where are all the people? Wait a minute. 
It's not my story. I don't know these people. If I say, no, exactly. We're not. We're not part of the club. We didn't. We didn't do it. We weren't not, part of the. It's not my but, story, and I don't know are. why. For example, all these. I don't know why Dan rather never talk about it. I don't know why they don't get out for the get out of their plane and talk to President Trump. Or I, I'm, these are stupid questions. I don't know that. I don't know why Jesus doesn't come back now. It's the same type of uh, objections you get with UFOs as well. Like some people, you That's say, exactly well, I right. this real phenomenon, and then they want me to answer every single. A straw man question that they have, and I just I can't because I don't know everything. Uh, it's the same with 9/11. There's there's enough wrong with the official explanation to just make you think this this stinks to high heaven, and um, so that's that's it. I mean, when you look at the, uh, the the disintegration of the World Trade Center complex, that's enough to just ask make you ask some serious questions about physics, how that actually happened. Do you remember Pentagon Columbo? Attack. Do you remember Peter Falk? Columbo, of course you do, right? Okay. Here's how Peter, and what do we love about Peter Falk? Uh, one more thing, your cigarette. <laughs> did you hold the cigarette with the left? Now, if we did Columbo the way 9-11 investigators do it, it would last 10 seconds. Did you shoot him, ma'am? No. Okay, that's it. That's, that's it. Ba, 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 da. End of show. No investigation. Mom, is, exactly. he said no. We love this curiosity. We love all these people. We love the way they think until it gets to be uh, in their way. Don't worry. It's probably for me. Don't worry about the phone. Let me leave you with this. First, Richard Dolan, it is beyond an honor. We must do this again. I'd be happy what to. What do you want people? I'm going to put all of your bona fides and all that stuff. What do you want people to know about you? How can they find you? What are you doing next? Now is your chance. Yeah. Um, well, they can always go to my rep website, which is richarddolanpress.com. Uh, I have everything about me is there. I also publish books by some really fascinating authors, uh, some of the most interesting people in this field. I'm, I'm lucky to be their publisher. So that's all there. Um, and that's probably a good place to start. I do um, a weekly uh, radio show, at least an occasional weekly radio show called The Richard Dolan Show. Uh, that's listed on my website. An occasional weekly radio. I like that. A program director's dream. I do. <laughs> I'm going to do a show for you occasionally, weekly. But uh, but let me t tell you, you, you have been. I've been uh, putting the word out. Whom should I speak with? Because sometimes you're very good. There are people who are great, and you get them on. And it's like I've had people I've recorded, and they just were horrible. Just so oh, bad. Yeah. yeah. So, but you're good. You know what you're doing. I've seen your stuff, and everybody says you got to talk to Dolan. You got to talk to him. Wow. I'm, yes. It, it amazes me. It honestly, it amazes me. Uh, just if I can, just on a personal level, say, um, when I got into the UFO field in the '90s, I felt like I walked away from all of the established, respectable types of studies that I'd been doing, and I go off into the fringe. I had a, a very close academic advisor who was shocked. I mean, absolutely shocked that I went off. I know. The UFOs, and and I just I've always worked on the assumption, honestly, that people in the alternative research field, politically minded people, like which is where really what I'm about, that they want nothing to do with me. In fact, a lot of the 9/11 people wanted nothing to do with me. I wrote a few pieces on 9/11, and they were like, "He's a UFO guy." <laughs> um, I did a I did a, a lecture. I was invited to speak at uh, the Left Forum. Uh, in yes. New York. Oh yes. And yes. I, I mean, I went, but they, but they had a, a really cool subgroup on the deep state. They wanted me to talk, and I went, and I caught so much grief over that from uh, a lot of these people. They were upset that um, that uh, I was into UFOs and all of this. So whenever I find anyone who actually knows what I do, I'm I'm almost like, yes, thank you. That's so nice. Well, of you. you are. Uh, I'm always surprised. You are exceedingly interesting fascinating. I want to thank you. Promise me we can do it again. And oh, let me absolutely. know whatever I can do to help you or to be a part of your world. You have been so... I want to thank you for the hours and the lectures and the thinking. And you are just terrific. And I thank you so much. It was such an, a pleasure, Richard Dolan. Thank you so much. My, my pleasure being on here. And it was... Uh, I hope we do this again. Excellent. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon. Thank you, my friend.